Real quick, if you want to follow each other's Twitter handles, we've got an opportunity for you to um, follow the witty handle if you're not already. And we will send you um, the list of Twitter handles. So if you follow the witty account, say, I want the list, then we'll DM you um, either a link or we could get your email address, I think. Actually send your email address in a, in a direct message so you're not posting your email address to everybody. Be careful about that. DM, DM, DM. <laughs> um, so there's that. Um, I, I want to dive right in here. I mean, first of all, Carolyn already covered. Last night was so amazing, so inspirational. We, ha we honored four wonderful, wonderful women, and three of them will be speaking today. So we get to have a second round of them. Um, and one of them is going to start off our morning keynote, and I just wanted to begin by saying one line that I've always loved my entire life since I was a little girl with my mom back on the farm in Maine. And she would sing Joni Mitchell, and she would sing, we are stardust, we are golden, and we've got to get ourselves back to the garden. So I can't stop thinking about that when I think about Gwen, because Gwen, you are helping us get back to the garden. So everyone, please welcome Gwen Chotwell, president of SpaceX. So good morning. <clears throat> it is such an honor to be invited yet again to speak. Um, and I, I can't say enough about this group. This is the first time that I've been exposed to Witty, and I can't imagine a more welcoming and warm and supportive environment. So thank you very much for that. Um, when I was asked to talk this morning, I always try to come up with something that could be helpful. Uh, and I never know what an audience wants. So I always start with something, and if you guys hate it, just raise your hand and just start asking questions, because I'd really rather address issues that you guys want to hear from me. <clears throat> but to give you a little bit of context, uh, I want to talk about uh, a little bit about what I do at a, a really extraordinary company called SpaceX. Um, fill in the gaps a little bit with some maybe some helpful ideas uh, for those of you that are looking at uh, starting businesses or promoting your current business. And finally, I always try to tell the story on how I became an engineer. I, you heard it a little bit in the video last night, but. Um, it was such a random and, frankly, flaky um, beginning, but it was, when I look back, it was so critical to who I am today. I, I want to share that, talk about how just kind of a random event can change your life. So um, to, st to start, I'll talk a little bit about my company, Space Exploration Technologies. We were founded 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago in 2002, to <clears throat> change the entire paradigm about space transportation. Uh, not necessarily to do what everybody else has done, but really promote uh, development of systems that will eventually take people off this planet uh, in case we need to or in case we don't need to. But it really is the greatest possible adventure for humans is to leave, uh, leave Earth. So what do you need to do to, to make that a reality? Space transportation systems need to have aircraft-like reliability, which is 100 to 1,000 times more reliable than they currently are today, and they have to be much less expensive. So we're working on solving that problem. Um, we've made some good strides. We've got lots left to do, decades uh, of work left to do. But um, just to give you a little more context, I'm going to show a quick video uh, on the background of my company, and then uh, I'll begin my remarks. So if we could show the overview video, please.
three, two, one. Lift off. Lift off of the Falcon 9. It is such a cool company, I can't, I can't tell you. <laughs> you know, when I was a car person growing up and I fell into the aerospace industry from a college professor, um, and thank goodness that, uh, that I did because rockets are really extraordinary. Um, so let me walk through, um, I don't really have a presentation, I've just got some slides. I wanna talk about uh, the events of about two weeks ago. Um, and this was our third flight of the Falcon 9 launch vehicle and the second flight of the Dragon capsule. Uh, and the point we were trying to uh, make with this, or what, what was the development here, and that was to transport cargo uh, to the International Space Station and bring science back. Um, so the rocket takes Dragon, the spacecraft, the little tug ship into orbit. Uh, we berth with the International Space Station, dump off the diapers, the food, whatever else the astronauts need at the time, some science. Actually, we had some great science from uh, middle school kids on this particular flight. Uh, and then we return both the science and whatever else uh, the astronauts want to pull off the station. Um, so what we've got is a little instructive for those of you that are not space weenies like myself. Rockets on the left. Love that photo on the right. The liftoff was on March, or excuse me, May 22nd, uh, middle of the night, and that is the Falcon 9 lifting off uh, with a uh, um, uh, kind of a mo it wasn't a mock-up shuttle, but it wasn't a flying shuttle, which in Cape Canaveral, really extraordinary. So then we deployed Dragon in orbit, and uh, she was trying to catch up with the space station. Took her about two days to do so. Uh, and then we flew underneath while the astronauts were monitoring how the spacecraft was doing. Then Don Pettit, uh, the astronaut that uh, grappled Dragon, he is a rock star as well. Couldn't ask for a better marketeer, which is amazing. So he grabbed Dragon, pulled her up, and berthed her to the International Space Station, opened the hatch, and all six of them went in the capsule. They weren't supposed to do that, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, so that's a great photo, all six of them packed in there. We actually designed this eventually to carry seven crew members. You don't want to spend a bunch of time. It's, a, it's about the size of a minivan. Uh, so you don't want to spend more than a day or so with your six best friends. <laughs> so then after we leave space station orbit, uh, we re-enter in that not quite so fiery, but pretty fiery re-entry. Come back to Earth. She floats around until the... Uh, commercial uh, salvage operators and uh, some of my staff go out and pick it up, pick her up. She, uh, the parachutes didn't cut right away, so she was uh, parasailing for a while. <laughs> Lift operation, muscling her onto the deck of that barge, and there she sits. Uh, she just made port this morning in Long Beach, 4.10 a.m. It's all about the middle of the night these days. Um, and uh, we'll be unloading the cargo in Texas, putting her on a, uh, uh, a truck, taking her to Texas, and uh, unloading the cargo and getting all that science back to NASA. So I wanted to walk you through this to talk a little bit about how extraordinary this was. Um, nations have done what we did last week. Uh, the European Union has done it with the ATV. 
Japan has done it with the HTV system, and Russia, of course, course, has done it for years with Progress and Soyuz. But what was really extraordinary about this event, it was because it was a public-private partnership. SpaceX, an entrepreneurial private firm, partnered with NASA. We were not a contractor to NASA. We were their partner. Um, we contributed about $300 million to this development. NASA contributed just under $400 million. And together, in partnership, we developed this capability and demonstrated it for about a fifth to a tenth of what normally would have, uh, it would have cost. Um, I wanted to talk about this because I think there are so many other opportunities to approach um, development, technology development, using this public-private partnership approach. Um, so so what, what was unique about it? Uh, NASA gave us, uh, we signed an agreement with NASA. They would fund up to a certain amount, and anything above and beyond that we had to fund ourselves, which we did, through some venture capital, uh, my, uh, some of my boss's private wealth, uh, as well as ongoing revenues from the business that I brought in. Um, NASA could not tell us what to do or how to do it, but they could tell us what to do. You need to make sure that the Dragon spacecraft interfaces with the International Space Station. If the parts don't fit, it was a big waste. Um, and the safety bits were mandated as well. But they couldn't tell us how to do that. And we saw over the course of the six-year, this was a six-year development, we saw over that six-year period just how powerful that is. The government isn't necessarily great at everything. Um, probably could get a lot of support for that statement here. Uh, <laughs> they are very good at some things. Um, but innovating and spinning designs to make something work uh, is not necessarily their, their, uh, their best contribution. Um, so basically it was the, um, the speed by which we were able to develop this system in partnership with NASA's immense knowledge. They've been doing this for decades, many decades. Um, some of their resources, they did provide a bit of capital, quite a bit of capital, actually. Um, and their kind of mature sense of, uh, of managing projects as well. There were plenty of times when we really wanted to move forward much faster, and they said, just hold up a little bit, not a lot, hold up a little bit, think about that decision. And uh, so together it was extraordinary. Um, and uh, we would not be the company that we are without NASA's support. Who cares what you read in the media um, about that? Uh, NASA did a great job, uh, and uh, and we really credit a lot them with, uh, with with making this work. So there are some other opportunities uh, that I think exist to to try to build more of these public-private partnerships. I think it's an extraordinary way to leverage taxpayer dollars. I mean, you're paying taxes. Wouldn't it be great if that money? kind of had it increase in by tenfold by leveraging with technologists like yourself. So offline, um, please contact me. And, and I'd love to chat with folks about how you might go ahead and get some of these programs started. So we've got some really good experience here now doing it. Um, solar, solar cells, solar generation, um, may seem mundane on the planet here. We pay between five and seven bucks a watt. In space, you pay over $1,000 a watt. So I think there's a lot of room uh, for some enterprise there. Um, search engines, the government's always, always looking for better and faster search engines to uh, scramble around the web and find data that uh, they would otherwise pay spies to go find. Um, so I think there's just tons of ideas. I've got tons of ideas. And for those of you that want to chat, please email me, Gwyn at SpaceX.com. Um, I'm easy to get a hold of, and I'm always on email. Um, talk a little bit about the results of, of, of this partnership. So we, we, we got to the station. It was extraordinary. But critically, this program helped develop the Falcon 9 launch vehicle, contributed to that development, um, and really brought launch dominance, or will be part of bringing launch dominance back to the U.S. This is all about economics. Uh, in the 90s, U.S. owned commercial launch. We lost it because our systems got uh, overly complex and incredibly expensive. Um, just as a kind of a heuristic for you, um, a Falcon 9 competitor domestically sells for about $420 million. That's what taxpayers are paying uh, for the kind of the government-supplied launch vehicles, and we sell Falcon 9 for $50 million. So almost dropping a zero, not quite. But uh, 
And it shouldn't be about the ride. I mean, rocket launches are cool, right? But really what you want is the data or the capability that you're placing into space. The rocket shouldn't really play that large of a role other than getting it there safely. You don't really care what kind of cab you take from the airport. I mean, do you, when you get out of the cab, do you remember what kind of car it was? No, you just wanted to get where you wanted to go safely. Um, so, and, and now we are competing internationally. We are winning deals overseas, uh, which is great. We probably will capture 20% of the market this year um, and maybe increase uh, a tenth or so every year till hopefully we'll have 50% by 14 or 15. Um, okay, so this is the first part of my talk about SpaceX, um, what we achieved, and critically, this public-private partnership. Does anybody have any questions about that before I go into my more personal story about how I became an engineer and how I ended up at SpaceX? Please? Yes? So do you retain, in that public-private partnership, do you retain the IP ownership? We actually do retain the IP. The government has march-in rights, meaning if we screw it, she asked about IP, do we retain the IP? If we screw it up and can't make a business out of it after a period of about five years, I think the government has march-in rights to come in and take it. But otherwise, we own it. So as long as we're using, leveraging it and marketing it and being successful, it's ours. And then what, what access do they have to the IP? They get insight, but they can't use it. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. More questions? Yes. There is no question. Yeah, we were founded to put people in space. So um, we're negotiating with NASA a contract right now to kind of kickstart that development. I don't know if you noticed, but Dragon has windows, and I don't think the cargo cares about windows. So it was, de <laughs> it was designed from the beginning to carry folks. Now, the process to put people on a craft like this, the engineering is almost all done. Um, we, we need to put a safety, it's called an escape system on board. Um, but those are also the engines that will power the descent as well, so we don't have to land in the ocean. Because uh, actually that was the roughest ride for Dragon, is uh, on that barge coming back. It was a four and a half day trip. Um, and we want to avoid that. We want to land on land very gently like you saw in the video. Um, so the hard part about that is certifying to ourselves and to the government who would be helping fund this project that we are safe enough to carry humans. It would be a very bad day to have an accident early on. Very bad day. So you want to make sure that doesn't happen. Sure. The, actually, if you want to talk about tradition, it's a capsule that got people to space first. Um, wings provide cross-range capability, so more maneuverability, but um, it complicates the aerodynamics pretty dramatically. It's, it's, not, it's not quite as safe. Not quite as safe. We're, we're stable regardless of what happens coming in. So, yes? Uh, watching the video and hearing you talk is making me... Oh, hello. Thank you. Um, uh, watching the video and, and hearing you speak is making me think back on a lot of science fiction reading as a kid, a lot of Ray Bradbury. Is there any sort of cult literature inside SpaceX headquarters that you guys always refer back to? Like, <laughs> I'm, like, on, on the good side, on, the, on the, the scary side, I'm just curious if there are associations you guys have. You know, I'm pretty sure there is. I don't, I don't know of the specifics, but I can tell you that we, our roots are founded in Star Wars, so not literature, but in, in film. Uh, uh, the Falcon was named after the Millennium Falcon, uh, and uh, Dragon was named after something different, like Puff the Magic Dragon. Um, <laughs> but we don't talk about that. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, you know, I was 13 when Star Wars came out the first time. And uh, I saw it recently, it came out again, what, two or three years ago, and I saw it with my son. And, I, and they talk about, the, and you get the Millennium Falcon, and I came back to Elon, I was like, why did you name it after Falcon? I mean, that thing was a piece of crap. <laughs> Duct tape and barely making it. And he said, yeah, but it's fast. <laughs> so that's why we were named Falcon. It's after the Millennium Falcon from Star Wars. So, yeah. I think almost everybody at SpaceX is, uh, is very into science fiction, I'm pretty sure. They're all space nutters, for sure. Yeah. More questions about this piece? Yes? 
you talk about 20% market share, 15, 20% market share. How big is the market in general for the business you do, and who's the competition for you at the moment? Yeah, that's a really good question, and I should have clarified. This is the most easily defined market is the um, is the geostationary, the communications, telecommunications satellites. Um, there's a, about 22 deployed every year uh, on uh, about 18 launches. Um, the Ariane 5 system takes two satellites at a time, assuming uh, you've got a medium and a small. Um, so that's why there's 18 launches and 22 satellites delivered to that orbit. Um, so Ariane 5 is a competitor. Their full system is bigger than the current Falcon 9, although not as big as the upgrade to this called the Falcon Heavy. Uh, they sell for about $220 million. Uh, the Proton system sold through International Launch Services uh, is a, a very powerful vehicle. Um, they have to launch out of northern latitudes in, uh, uh, in the former Soviet republics, um, so they don't get as much payload to orbit, but they sell for about $100 million. Uh, we sell Falcon 9, the, the small one. It's a million pounds of thrust getting off the deck uh, for 50, and then it's part its sister vehicle, the Falcon Heavy, for about 85. Uh, the Chinese will be probably our strongest competitors moving forward. They launch 20 times a year, almost solely for uh, national systems, although they're starting to get some play on the commercial arena as well. Um, and they sell for about 75, comp comparable to Falcon 9. So the the... the the real competition is international. The, the U.S. vehicles are not competitive. Question on the, over here. Uh, question on your, oh, you said you're winning deals overseas, and you also said you're retaining IP rights. Are you winning deals overseas that are not the nature of uh, challenging IP, or are you worried about challenging, stop with the camera, please. Uh, are you worried about uh, uh, sharing any of the IP secrets that your program has with some nations that don't have the same kind of laws and rules? No, we sell services. We don't sell our launcher, never sell our IP, and we are, pro uh, we are prohibited from sharing information about our launch vehicle uh, through the International Trade and Arms Regulations, ITAR. Uh, this a rocket is considered a munition because you can deliver a munition anywhere on the planet or other planets uh, with it. So uh, the U.S. government ensures that we don't share information. So we've got programs and practices in place to ensure we don't do that. No, we don't, we're not going to give up our IP. We fought very hard for that. <laughs> yes? Would I go up? Absolutely, I'll go up. I can't afford it. <laughs> it's quite expensive, actually. Um, the system that we're looking at uh, to develop for NASA, we could take seven folks up on Dragon, and it will probably cost us 140 to 150 million dollars. So that's 20 million a seat. Pretty sure I'm not going to get a free ride. <laughs> no, I'd be happy to go. I want to tell a brief story to help you understand the um, the extraordinary folks uh, at SpaceX. So we had just moved into our big facility in Hawthorne. And uh, at the time, we probably had about six or 700 people. And we, Elon addressed, this was when I was vice president, not president. Elon addressed the group and said, so who, who would go up? And, uh, you know, everybody but three stood up. And then he said, well, who would go up on the first one? And maybe two or three folks sat down. But they were all ready to go. I mean, it's going to be a big battle to figure out who flies first, because they will be SpaceX astronauts. We won't be flying NASA astronauts for quite a few quite a few flights. So it's, I, don't, I don't really know, I don't know what that world looks like. So my employees are happy right now, but when we start having competition for astronaut spaces, I, I don't know what that world looks like. Maybe more aggressive parties, I think. Start knocking people off. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. Donna, sorry. Gwen, uh, yeah. Gwen I, you were vice president of business development before you were president. I'd like to ask about business development that is potentially happening, particularly with regards to um, marketing. Um, when we look at the space shuttle, it's all white. And so there's obviously an opportunity, just like you know, in NHL hockey, where you have companies that are sponsoring. Um, and we're, we're in the Tesla Motors neighborhood. They just shipped the first car, so we're all very excited about that and really rooting for their success. So I just wondered uh, what that if that has started and, and what the possibilities are with regards to even more partnerships for you to bring down those costs. You know, it's interesting. I was, uh, so she's a 
pretty much, I think you're asking about commercial marketing and would we slap uh, Pepsi or Pizza Hut or <laughs> Nike logos on our dragon. And um, we actually strongly considered it. Uh, one very popular brand, Athletic Gear, approached us and said, you know, we want to be on your spacesuits. And we thought about it. They offered a bit of money, about something like $5 million a year over a number of years. It sounded like a lot. It was like a six-year deal, $30 million bucks. It sounded like a lot. And then we thought, you know what? I think our brand is better than that. We're, we're not going to go do that. Um, launches are cool. We really hope to bring launch to the point where it's ubiquitous and boring. Um, so I don't know how long that kind of, I don't know how long Coke or Pepsi or Pizza Hut would want to put a logo on the rocket. So we're not, we're really not going there. We thought about it. Um, but 50 million for a launch, 5 million a year for the swoosh on a spacesuit, probably not. So we're, we're not really approaching it that way. So the marketing is pretty straightforward. There are not that many organizations on the planet that buy launch. It's probably 100 or 120. So marketing for this kind of business is dramatically different from toothpaste or cosmetics. You know, there are not billions of, uh, of uh, potential customers until we're flying crew. Then there's six billion potential customers. <laughs> um, so I have a question here. Regarding your ITAR comment, do we have to get approval? Do you have to get approval from the government before you sell it international? We have to get the approval from the government to do a lot in this business. We have to have a license, um, ATF license. I guess this is a firearm. So we keep our annual ATF license. Um, we have to get an FAA license to actually lift off. If we're on a federal range, we have to get range safety licensing and approvals um, through the Air Force. Um, and State Department uh, does grant us a license to execute this defense service. Uh, which is what it's called when you launch satellites to orbit. So, yeah, we do get a license for all our international customers. We're getting really good at that. About 11% uh, of our, we've got over 40 Falcon 9 missions sold. 11% um, are to international governments, and another 30 or so are uh, international commercial participants. So almost half our business is overseas. I mean, we launch it here, but it's money from overseas coming into the U.S., which is awesome. More questions on the businessy side? Yes. challenges, the type of talent you're looking for, um, what would be your challenge within the next five years to bring in the right um, expertise to achieve your goals? So the question is, what are our hiring challenges? Um, you know, we had three failures of the little rocket Falcon 1, which you may have seen in the video. Um, it was hard to hire in that time frame. Uh, once we got Falcon 1 to orbit, I think we got 3,000 resumes over the weekend emailed to us. So there's lots of talent. Um, getting folks to move to L.A. is a challenge. Real estate is still very expensive, even though it's dropped 25 or so percent in the last uh, four year, three or four years. Um, it's hard to get, harder to get mid-level engineers. We can get almost any, we call them fresh outs, we can get almost any college graduate that we want. They're very excited about what we're doing. We offer them a very fast-paced environment, not, o not only just on a day-to-day -day basis, but many engineers, certainly ones that are interested in space, you work for a big aerospace, traditional aerospace company that do good work, of course, but you start a project and it's not going to launch for 15 or 20 years, so you kind of lose motivation, whereas you can build something and fly it uh, a year and a half or two years later. So fresh outs are easy. Um, Mid-level engineers tend to be harder, especially if they have families moving to L.A. And we've not considered moving to a less expensive part of the country. So that, that is a big challenge. Senior folks, the challenge is, uh, depends on what industry they come from. It's not a really a good culture fit. You know, SpaceX is a pretty tough environment to work in, um, not from any perspective of hostility, uh, but it is a meritocracy. And um, some can operate in that environment, and some have a harder time. I'm curious to know um, how much of the rockets are made in the U.S. By mass, 99.999% of our rocket. Not our, yay. Um, our domestic competitors, uh, the Atlas V is powered with a Russian RD-180 engine. 
they fly a uh, Swiss fairing and interstage. Um, the Delta line of vehicles, I believe, has some overseas content, not, not as much as the Atlas. I think we, uh, we do buy some um, raw material overseas. Uh, we were buying from the U.S., and then that particular uh, aluminum shop got sold to a French company called Pechene. So we do, we do buy a lot of overseas metals, but uh, our GPS receiver, sorry, I'm thinking and talking, which is dangerous. Um, our GPS receiver, I believe, is German, Javad. Um, and our star trackers are from the U.K. for Dragon. But I, other than that, I don't think we buy anything overseas. More questions? Okay, so now I'm going to talk about my flaky beginnings as an engineer. Um, you know, I used to be embarrassed about it, and then now I, it's screw it. I, it's what happened, and uh, I, I'm not ashamed of it. Uh, so I, I tell the story. So I'm in high school. I'm good in, well, I, I got straight A's in high school. I didn't get straight A's in college. <laughs> um, but my mom saw some potential in technology for me. She was an artist. And... Um, I remember driving down the road in third grade saying, how does a car work? You know, how does, how does an engine work? So she, she didn't know. She bought me a book, and I read it. And I'm like, okay, I kind of got that. Um, so I, from the beginning, I was interested in cars. Um, but I was a pretty traditional little girl growing up in the 60s and 70s. Uh, I was a cheerleader, uh, played varsity basketball, um, and... Never, ever dreamed at all about being an engineer. I mean, I didn't even know what they did. They drive trains, right? That's what we grow up. Engineers drive trains. So uh, my mom took me on a Saturday to Illinois Institute of Technology, a Society of Women Engineers event. I, I think it was in the summer. It was a long time ago. I was trying to figure out the date last night because some lovely woman is going to try to help me track down that engineer. Um, I wasn't happy about it. You know, mom dragging me down to Illinois Institute of Technology. Oh, my God. God, what a nose-picking place. How awful. Um, and scary, awful and scary. Um, and uh, the mechanical engineer was perfectly dressed. She had a fabulous suit on, the best shoes on the panel. No joke. I went to talk to her because I liked the way she dressed. No, it's not a joke. Um, not an exaggeration by any stretch. But So I talked to her. I ran up afterwards. I wasn't shy as a kid either, but I ran up to her, and she was talking about what she did. She was a mechanical engineer studying more materials, had her own research company and materials company. And this was in, this was probably late 70s. And she was worried and focused about green building materials in that time. And she inspired me. I said, okay, so, so she's a mechanical engineer. I'll be a mechanical engineer that day. And I Applied to one university, mechanical engineering department, got in, got my degree, went to work for Chrysler Motors as a mechanical engineer. Didn't like it, actually. Car person going to Chrysler did not like it. They hired all their engineering overseas. It was so disappointing. You know, here I was a young, starry-eyed engineer wanting to do engineering, and I was a project manager for these great engineers that were in Japan. It wasn't interesting. So I went back to get my Ph.D. in applied math, one of my favorite courses. It's engineering analysis. Um, just couldn't stand to be broke again because I had a pretty good job with Chrysler. So I left after a year with my master's degree, went out to Aerospace Corporation, was there for exactly a decade. As my first boss said, I flew in on my broom on Halloween, 1988. <laughs> yes, he did say that. Um, it didn't feel hostile, but uh, he did say that. I was there for a decade, went to a small company called Microcosm for four years, and then after that uh, ran into Elon uh, at his crazy SpaceX shop, and uh, I guess it's history since then. I've been there for 10 years. I was the seventh employee. We have almost 1,900 now. So it's been quite a ride, I have to say. It's been extraordinary. And the people that I work with, I mean, I have the greatest job in the world because there's 1,900 people that just kick butt every day. It's amazing. So that's my story. Um, I have a, a, one more video. I wasn't sure I was going to get this together because this is on the last mission. Um, if you don't mind, I'll play one more video. It's a little bit long, four minutes, and then I think I have a, still a little bit more time for questions, just like two or three more minutes for any follow-up questions. So thank you very much for your time. It's really an honor and a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. 
and we'll show the video quickly and then maybe a couple of follow-ups and then I'll get off the stage. You guys can get back to business. <laughs> so this is a video of our last mission. All propellant tanks at first. Minus 20. Fire X is on. Is that Mission Control seconds. Headquarters? That's the people outside of Mission Control. The mosh pit. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Stage 1. We have liftoff of the Falcon 9. Falcon 9 has cleared the tower. Starting pitch kick. Dragon itself, looking up at the International Space Station. Capture is confirmed. Uh, Houston Station looks like we got us a dragon by the tail. That's Don Pettit, rock star. I spent quite a bit of time poking around in here this morning just looking at the engineering and the layout and I'm very pleased so flying up in a, a human rated dragon is uh, not going to be an issue. Have like one or two minutes. Any more questions? Happy to answer them. Yes, way in the back. So the question that most probably all of us have in here: How will you be able to balance your work with your family? Well, balance doesn't mean 50/50, right? It means it's stable, right? 
So um, I have an extraordinary family. Uh, my husband uh, is incredibly supportive. Um, and my children, for whatever reason, are nothing like me. They are straight-A students, love what I'm doing, and totally get that after I do cook them dinner. You know, I try to take care of them as much as I can. Um, but they totally understand that I go back to work when I, well, I don't, like, leave the house, go back to work. But I, I go back to work after we settle in for an hour or hour and a half in the evening. So it, it's not, it's balanced because it's stable and it's working just fine for now. <laughs> I'm sorry? To the car? Oh, to the rocket. Yeah, I'd be thrilled to death. That means they're engineers. Go. Go. That'd be okay by me. Any more? Yes. Hello. Thank you for everything. I'm very uh, thrilled. I, I don't know how to say I don't speak perfect English. I'm from Chile. And I wanted to ask you, you spoke about uh, the accidental, you said, or something like uh, when you, yes, you said something like accidental things that happen in life that yes. you have to, uh, okay. Yes. So what were the, um, the kind of serendipitous, accidental, whatever you want to call them. So the first was my mom dragging me to Illinois Institute of Technology and this random mechanical engineering fabulous woman catching my attention. Um, I think my job at, uh, at Aerospace Corporation, which led me, was a little bit accidental. I was walking out of tech, that's the engineering school at Northwestern, and I ran into an under, uh, this was when I was working on my PhD, and I ran into an undergraduate professor, and he, he worked at aerospace at the time. He said, Gwen, you should come apply at aerospace. I'm like, okay, because I was not happy in my PhD. I was broke. Uh, I, you know, I would go from 50000 a year working at Chrysler, this was a long time ago, to a uh, $12,000 a year fellowship. That was tough. Um, and then working at SpaceX was pretty random as well. Like, I ran into Elon picking a friend up for lunch and said he needed a new business developer. So I got the new business development job. <laughs> so it's all pretty random. Yeah, and I, I really hope that, uh, I, I spoke to the Northwestern graduating class last year at their uh, commencement. Um, and uh, I really tried to push the fact that engineers always like certainty. You know, you engineer and you analyze for certainty. And life is anything but certain. And take those random events, regardless of where they will take you, because it's, it's important. Yes, and surely I'm going to get you next. I'm so sorry. So we're, both, we're all returning to families and communities where there are not enough girls going into technology. So if, from, your, from your mouth, what should we tell them that you had to say about why technology is cool and being a woman in science is cool? You know, science is still scary for girls, um, less, much less scary. It's becoming okay to be nerdy, right? And I think Silicon Valley has a lot to do with that, frankly. Um, there's a lot of uh, very successful people who probably weren't the coolest girls or guys growing up in middle school, and yet, you know, they're running the world right now. So I think that has been helpful. Um, my pitch to girls is you don't have to be an engineer. Just go get an engineering degree, right? Just go get an engineering degree. It teaches you how to think, teaches you how to solve problems, um, and it's just a great foundation. Then you can go off and get a master's degree in fine arts or European literature or something, but if you just, if I can just get them into the engineering curricula undergrad, or physics, physics is amazing. If I were to do it again, I'd probably get a degree in physics. Um, so that's, that's kind of my pitch. It's not scary at all. Um, actually, you know, can we go back to the PowerPoint? I want to show one picture, extraordinary science, that there is students, um, middle school, and one younger girl uh, on some of the science teams for the payload that we took up. And we didn't make it on the first shot. We tried to launch on May 19th. So these darling kids were there watching the launch. They wanted to see their science go. And... Uh, and we, we missed it. We, we uh, shut down the engines because we were struggling with one of the engines. And then we, we came back on the 22nd and, and relaunched. 
But I, we, we paid to bring those kids back. SpaceX paid to bring those kids back. So let me show you this photo. That's me as a teenager. That's when I was a cheerleader and thinking that engineers drove trains. So this little girl here, Kate Pierbolt, I think she's 10, and she was one of the principal investigators of the science that we took up to the International Space Station, and that's her big brother. He's 13, looking down at her, and it was so darling to get to meet them, and she was so shy, but I you know, was coaxing her and talking to her, and she's just darling, so she wrote me a little letter, and I hope she becomes an engineer too. And then let me show you one more picture. Those are my babies, yay. <laughs> And I am ashamed. The picture on the left is 10 years old. They're six feet tall. Um, but uh, I found these pictures, and I scanned them. I can't find our electronic pictures. I guess I need to hook up more with my husband and find out where he puts them. Um, yeah, so I'm pretty sure my daughter is going to get her undergraduate degree. She's not sure, so she's like, all right, I'll get, a, I'll get an engineering undergrad, and then I'll get to get a JD, MBA, just to cover everything. My son is a computer gamer. I have no idea what he's going to do. Absolutely no idea. And that's part of the very rough and tumble crew uh, at SpaceX who hauled that dragon out of the water and put her on board. So it's really great. I probably used up more than my time. I really appreciate uh, the audience and the warmth. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs>